Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Speaker. With me, we have today James Henry. James, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks, Joe. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So um, first question I've got to ask is uh, your accent, that beautiful accent. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> I've been working on it for my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was born in London, uh, grew up in a few different parts of the UK, so I don't have a super easy to pigeonhole British accent. It's, it's pretty vanilla. It's like a, any rough edges are mostly shaved off. So it's, mm. I grew up in the Northeast for between the ages of seven and 18. So mm -hmm. the, the locals to that area have a very strong accent. I don't have that accent. I was kind of, I was old enough to not absorb it, I guess. Right. Uh, Cause neither of my parents have that accent. My mom is from the uh, Republic of Ireland. So she had a very different voice to my dad. And I've just sort of ended up with some kind of average of all the influences <laughs> I had. Um, and yeah, I studied in Germany and lived in Canada and now the Middle East. So I've gone on to surround myself with more random accents. So I guess, yeah, there's potentially influences from all over the place. That's awesome. Oh, that's amazing. Well, very cool. So uh, tell us, how did you get the programming? I wanted to make my MySpace profile very cool. Um, Seriously, MySpace. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I went in maybe 2004, three or four. Um, you, MySpace was the thing. You could maybe have, maybe some people had a Bebo account, but otherwise MySpace was the dominant thing, particularly in the UK. I'm not sure what it was like in the US. Um, but everyone had a MySpace profile. You showed off your top 10 friends and the, uh, whatever Panic at the Disco song you were into at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the really cool things about MySpace was if you copy and pasted this gibberish into your About Me box instead of just text, it would actually take that gibberish and interpret it and customize your page. And so there were a thousand and one generator websites out there where you could upload a photo and say, this is my background image and I want to tile it or I want to make the background black and blue stripes, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess at some point, I just was very curious, how is this gibberish making the background black? Or where is this image actually coming from versus my computer? And uh, so I just started tinkering with the actual gibberish, which mm -hmm. obviously I then discovered was a thing called HTML and CSS. Um, and uh, the most important thing I did was I went around MySpace, tracking down actual web developers' MySpace pages. So rather than just the, the cookie cutter generator output, people were handcrafting these unbelievable pages. And obviously JavaScript wasn't available. I'm pretty sure they escaped all JavaScript. There was nothing you could get through, but so, and, and obviously HTML and CSS were far more limited in those days. Right. Um, so it was art, pro proper artistry that was being done by these folks. And I would just same, shamelessly inspect all view source because I'm not even sure inspect element was a thing then, but right. view source, copy, paste, tweak, copy, paste, tweak, copy, paste, tweak. And that got me to making some really nice MySpace pages. And then eventually that wasn't enough of a drug anymore because I'd, I'd solved all the things I wanted to solve. And so PHP was the next thing that I took up so that I could build kind of fully functional websites that spoke to databases, um, PHP, MySQL kind of stack with Apache and stuff. So um, that was, it. it was just kind of bit by bit by bit. I wanted to do this thing. I didn't yet know how to do it. And I, I looked it up and I had a PHP for dummies <laughs> book, uh, which I learned the language through. And a friend of mine at school was uh, kind of a few years on from that, if you like, he'd started earlier. And so I was very fortunate. He was willing to spend some time hacking on some stuff with me, teaching me some things. We used version control with using subversion for our PHP applications. Nice, nice. Um, so yeah, that, that was it. It was just sort of more and more and more. And um, a node I took over entirely from PHP, maybe 20, 13, 14, is that the right kind of time frame? Maybe that I was, yeah, basically transitioned almost, I, I was using code igniter, then Laravel mm -hmm. and then, and Laravel was quite new then. And then I kind of transitioned completely away from that when I discovered that I could basically do everything in node and then I didn't need to switch context between my front end JavaScript with jQuery everywhere. Right. And, uh, then Backbone actually, Backbone was the first nice. kind of framework or nice. like, or like view library that I ever used. <laughs> Oh, very um, cool. So yeah, and then that led me to AngularJS because um, I made an AngularJS. Uh, sorry, I made a Backbone app 
mm -hmm. at work, which wasn't my day job, but I made it to talk to an API that we had at the company. And a colleague of mine basically was like found this thing called AngularJS. Uh, I think it was version 0.8. Mm -hmm. And uh, he basically rewrote the entire app in like a tenth of the amount of code. Right. And right. It the two-way data binding just blew my mind. And yeah, Backbone was very clear delineation between model view controller. And it was nice, it was predictable, but it was verbose. And uh, then AngularJS just changed changed the game. So that's that takes us to the Angular world. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the whistle stop tour of my uh, like main highlights working up to Angular world. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about your talk. What do you be speaking on at NTConf? So I have spent a lot of time and effort on linting. Um, so created TypeScript DSLint and Angular DSLint. And, uh, so unsurprisingly, my talk is about linting, um, specifically for folks who are still using TSLint, obviously TSLint having been end of life by Palantir who created it and maintained it. Um, Angular ES Lint is the project I created. It's fully available as a replacement, um, but folks might not be so familiar or maybe a bit intimidated by the process of changing out something that they know uh, with something that they don't. Right. So I decided to go for a very focused five minute talk, which I've never done before. I thought it would also be an interesting challenge to do a five minute talk and make sure it's very valuable for folks. Um, so five minutes, converting a TSLint workspace to become an ESLint workspace and power on to bigger and better things. So that's what I'm focusing on for my talk. Very cool, very cool. Well, um, all right, let's get a little bit serious here. I'll ask you a serious question. How do you deal with imposter syndrome when you encounter it? It's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say that I have any kind of go-to strategy i think it's come in waves and it's I, I don't i don't even know if it's even manifested in exactly the same ways sometimes it might be that i'm trying to solve a really hard problem and maybe it's a really important problem as well so it's not even oh i might not be able to get it it's, it feels like a lot is on the line and so i feel like i might be letting other people down if i can't solve the problem so i feel like that's when it starts to kick in for me so a lot of those times, if it's that specific manifestation of it, it's often solved by just shutting everything down and going for a walk or sleeping a night and not going on too late and making sure I get eight hours plus. Hmm. Um, and it's just about convincing yourself that that's actually a good idea because you think pressure, important thing to deliver. I'm working. I've got to keep working. And actually that's, it's, it's pretty well known, I think, but having, it's, it's hard to remind yourself in the moment that having that separation, your synapses reconnect in different ways and you suddenly find the, the solution to your problem, maybe even when you're away from the keyboard. Right. Um, so that's those kind of problems. I think and the, the softer side, the, the other manifestation might be if I'm working with somebody who's particularly brilliant um, and you just kind of feel maybe inadequate by comparison, I'm very lucky that through working with Narwhal for a long time, I've worked with some fantastic developers and uh, encountered some fantastic developers at the clients that we work with. So um, it's not a non-existent problem, <laughs> uh, but it's a very good problem to have. And um, I, as I say, I don't know if I have a, an exact strategy for dealing with it. Often it's just a case of um, reminding yourself that everyone is facing different sets of challenges Maybe that person that you think is unbelievable is bashing their head against the keyboard, trying to solve a hard problem, like I just mentioned, and they desperately need to go for a walk and <laughs> right. clear their head. And it's, 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 it's reminding yourself that most of the time you see a version of people that they want you to see, not because they're being disingenuous, but because that's just how we all operate. That's, that's life. Um, and so you're not necessarily seeing every single doubt or insecurity that they have and you're seeing 100% of those doubts and insecurities that you have. Right. Um, so yeah, I guess in both scenarios, it's perspective. And anything you can do to change your perspective, like changing your physical environment or changing your state by exercising or getting fresh air or whatever, that's often a good stimulus for your brain to be like, oh, actually, no, I was going down a weird path there. That's maybe not productive. Mm. Cool. Awesome. Well, good advice. All right, well, uh, let's finish up. We're going to move into our rapid fire round. 
So go. I'm going to give you a series of A or B choices. Pick one or the other. No explanation necessary. You can pick neither or both if, if the situation requires. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. First one, very standard, Kirk or Picard? I would say Kirk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ruby or Scala? Ruby. Game of Thrones or Squid Game? Oh, it feels like an unfair comparison because it's it's like the fact that the Game of Thrones went on for so long and Squid Game's only had one season. So I yeah I loved season one of Squid Game, but season one of Game of Thrones was unbelievable, and season two and season three were also unbelievable. So I have to give it to Thrones. Let's not talk about the final seasons. <laughs> All right. Squid Game could definitely end up in that place as well because where are they even going to take the concept into a second season? I don't know. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, guitar or piano? <laughs> <laughs> these are just props. I can't play either of these. Um, I, I've been playing the guitar since I was 12 and the ukulele then is quite easy to pick up if you play the guitar. Um, so that's definitely my kind of, yeah, historical baby. I, I regretted not having spent more time playing the piano when I was a kid because mm. it's much harder to take up when you're older. So, um, I, I love playing the piano. I'm not very good. <laughs> so I would, and the guitar has been with me through thick and thin. And right. uh, so I would give it to the guitar. All right. Okay. Uh, Veet or Webpack? <sighs> hmm. See, I still remember when Webpack was the Veet of its moment. Like yep. mm -hmm. Browserify was the dominant force and we were all using Bower. <laughs> and uh, require js and webpack the thing that caught me with webpack was being able to require your css files that was like wizardry um so i haven't used Vite enough i i know the architecture of Vite, and i know how much faster and more efficient it can be for certain projects and builds and vtest as well for testing versus jest it's ha it has the advantage of learning all of the lessons that Webpack has learned and then just approaching it with a fresh stack, a faster, lower level stack. Um, so it's, it's what, what criteria do we judge it on? Can't be longevity because obviously Webpack would win, but then yeah, build metrics, you could give it to me. It's, it's, I, have to, I probably have to plead the fifth on that one, I think, because <laughs> it feels like an unfair comparison at this point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting space. I'm certainly one of those people who's waiting to see what an official ES build, or I, I believe they have already merged an experimental ES build um, builder into the Angular CLI stack already. Really? And that's obviously the, the core tool that powers Beat as well. So that's going to be an interesting space to watch, I think. Okay. All right, last one. Cricket or quit it? <laughs> I, I, you have to say cricket. I, I played a lot of cricket growing up and yeah. I don't own a broom, so I didn't play any Quidditch. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, James, for taking your time to meet with us and uh, chat. And thanks for everybody for listening. Hope you had a fun time getting to know a little bit more about James. We're really looking forward to your talk and getting to see you in person and hopefully everybody that's watching this as well. Yep. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks for having me. Okay. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye.